If you would have asked me 30 years ago how I thought the world would move toward one world government, I most certainly would have said through military conquest. However, as we've seen in our last video, the most intelligent, most influential, most wealthiest humans are working their agenda toward a one world government through financial market manipulation. The elites figured out that certain trends fluctuated the markets and in turn nations were driven in certain directions by the which way the markets fluctuated. So these elites figured if they can manipulate those trends they can actually steer nations in the directions they want them to go. So how is the world going to end up in one world government? By economic means, not by military. And just to give you an example of how this is done, I want to spend a little time and show you how they manipulate the market. In 1982 to 83, President Reagan signed three key security directives aimed at collapsing and straining the Soviet Union for economic and technological advancement. The campaign to reduce Soviet hard currency began cooperation between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia to drive down the price of oil, which is Rus Russia's number one export, and to limit its natural gas exports to the West. The process by which the New York MEX, the WTI, and the CIA worked the collapse of the Soviet Union started a new trend. Unique skilled policymakers steeped in knowledge of financial and commodity market manipulation. of armed superpowers, war ain't like it used to be. Direct military confrontation by two countries has always been the least attractive and last resort, but with the risks now of rapid escalation to global thermonuclear missile exchanges, a tacit understanding seems to have emerged among the nuclear armed powers that head-to-head -head conflicts which could lead to overt shooting engagements are to be avoided at all costs. They are a no-win proposition. That does not mean the big guys do not have serious differences, gripes, and conflicting national interests. It just means that sanity requires these conflicts to be pursued by means other than direct military action between nuclear armed states. Even if direct military conflict cannot be averted, its outcome is usually sealed years in advance in the relative economic strength and strategic political positioning of the belligerents. Now with the stakes so high in any great power military conflict, much more emphasis is placed on non-military forms of coercion, dominance, and conquest. This can include ideological or psychological warfare, covert operations, efforts to compromise or undermine an opponent regime, or use of third party of surrogate military or paramilitary groups aimed at creating havoc without overtly revealing the real adversary. Such may be the origins of Al-Qaeda and any of the dozens of supposedly indigenous rebel and guerrilla organizations active to varying degrees around the world. What are the odds any such movement could long survive, let alone pull off elaborate terror events without some form of state sponsorship? But those kinds of peripheral nuisance activities may have little real impact on a major nation state with internal controls and a strong military. What is instead gaining increasing attention in statecraft is the non-military equivalent of conventional attrition combat, large-scale economic warfare. In its overt form, this can include embargoes or blockades of strategic goods and commodities, tariffs, trade sections and legal battles under trade rules. 
but more corrosive over time could be the long-term effects of more subtle manipulation of currencies, interest rates, commodity prices, and other markets aimed at limiting an opponent's country's economic growth and fomenting civil unrest. Like a skillful torture which leaves no visible bruise marks, clever application of such principles could make it appear that Adam Smith's free market invisible hand was responsible for delivering the blows. Successfully waged by a strong opponent, long-term economic warfare could thwart an opponent's ability to amass the wealth and power needed to sustain direct military confrontation. It might even achieve relatively bloodless regime change in a weak rival state unable to keep its populace fed and employed. That was the fate of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Peter Schweitzer, in his book, The Reagan Administration, Victory Over the Soviets with Economic Warfare, did not explain exactly how the U.S. and its allies succeeded in driving down the price of oil in the 1980s, except to note that the Saudi decision in August of 1985 to open the floodgates, slash its prices, and pump more oil into the market. He credited this crucial Saudi decision to the personal assurances by President Reagan to the Saudi King, King Fahd, in early 1985 during a White House visit that the U.S. would protect Saudi Arabia against any military moves by Iran. From only about $3 billion a year in oil export revenues in 1972, Soviet hard currency oil sales to the capitalist world soared to around $25 billion in 1980 and peaked in 1983 at around $26 billion, with Soviet oil production rising to almost 12 million barrels a day at its peak in 1988. It was the world's largest producer and second only to Saudi Arabia as an oil exporter at 4.1 million barrels a day. As the Reagan oil price war gained momentum, though aided by the Saudi decision to boost its output in 1985, Russian oil revenues plunged. Geider calculates Soviet oil export income had fallen to $10 billion in 1986, re remaining below $15 billion through 1989 despite a mostly futile attempt to ramp up production and export volumes. All told, the cumulative loss in Soviet hard currency earnings due to the oil price drop from 1983 to 1989 added up to about $80 billion in lost revenue for the Soviets. A further effect of the 1985 oil price down draft was a big drop in Soviet foreign arms sales, another key hard currency earner as its biggest customers in the Middle East faced budget strains. To make matters even worse for Moscow and OPEC, the Reaganites had engineered a steep decline in the value of the US dollar after 1985, so whatever hard currency income they were getting for their crude was plunging in real value. By mid-1986 it took five times as much Russian oil sales volume to afford a given piece of West German machinery than it did a year before. And so Communist Russia was defeated economically, not by military means. So what do we have here today? Gas at $5 and $4 a gallon? They want us to believe that it's because of uh, situations and events that are happening over the Middle East or the Persian Gulf or weather or China. It's ridiculous. 
25 years ago, they controlled the gas prices. They controlled not only gas prices, but the natural gas prices to weaken the Soviet economy. Now today, gas prices are soaring, food commodities are soaring, and they, they tell us these lies. The fact is, there's another economic war going on. Let's take a look. The most interesting question in the world today is what will China do with its increasing economic power? It's an extraordinarily explosive question because when one thinks back to the 1930s, in many ways World War II began with the Japanese invasion of China, not in Europe. Well, I don't think China is content as simply a regional power. China believes that it deserves to be on par with the United States. Uh, the long-term goal uh, for the Chinese leadership is to become a dominant power in the region. You know? And as a matter of fact, they said it in public that the long-term goal, strategic goal, is to eject the U.S. influence from the Asia-Pacific region. Well, China is developing the capability to launch uh, ICBMs against the United States. Uh, the same capability Russia had during the Cold War. Next five to ten years, uh, they'll have a new missile called the DF-31A, which will be able to hit anywhere in the United States with nuclear weapons. This is a new uh, phenomenon, something that the Americans don't seem to notice. Uh, I don't know why we don't pay attention to it, but it's a serious matter. Maybe containing China's rise is the real reason why the U.S. keeps all these bases in Asia. But is it realistic for us to believe that we will never have to share the world with another superpower? Let no one deceive you. The real fact of the matter is there is so much oil in the ground. It's unbelievable. There are so many oil reserves that haven't been tapped yet in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait, just to mention some of the countries, it's crazy. They're trying to find ways to keep the oil in the ground. If too much oil comes out, the, the prices of the gas go so low, nobody makes any money off it. That's what happened to the Soviets. Now, OPEC, which is Organization of Petroleum Export Countries, was created to control the global gas price. And the major swing player was the Saudis and America has pledged to protect Saudi Arabia forever for cooperating with them. China is going to be very sensitive to where their oil comes from and how assured that supply is going to be. It looks like they cannot do but rely overwhelmingly in the Middle East. To get Middle East oil they need to be assured that the sea lines of communication with the Middle East are open. Right now, the sea lines of communication are open because of U.S. naval power. So, an economic war between the U.S. and China? Oil pricing would have to be a primary battlefront for the U.S. and its allies. Oil supply, which was a major strength for the Soviets, is a particular weakness for China. It has to import nearly as great a share of its petroleum needs as does the U.S., but is much less able to afford it. China's consumption of oil is not very efficient. Much of it goes for what would be low-value uses in the West, such as power generation and industrial heat. China's refineries are generally not configured to run heavy, sour crude, so they must buy more expensive, light, sweet crude. And since oil is priced in dollars, China pays a stiff premium when it uses its underdevalued currency. High oil prices are a pain in the neck for Americans, but they could strangle the Chinese economy. Logistically, the bulk of China's 4 million barrels a day of oil imports comes from the Persian Gulf through the Straits of Malacca. That makes those shipments particularly vulnerable to U.S. interdiction in the event of an oil embargo. Soon after becoming the PRC president in 2003, Hugh Hianito warned of China's Malacca Dilemma. 
To circumvent that route would require almost 1,000 nautical miles of added tanker travel. That would add several days in considerable expense per voyage while still facing overwhelming U.S. sea power. That Malacca traffic is also vulnerable to pirate attacks, which could be a cover for state-sponsored harassment. In the event of a U.S.-led oil embargo in retaliation for some future invasion of Taiwan or other aggressive act, China would quickly feel the economic pinch of a physical interruption in crude oil deliveries. But such an embargo would be overt, controversial, and could likely be applied by the U.S. for only a limited time. More damaging over the course of years or decades could be the effects of a very high oil prices, like a relentless tax, the high cost of foreign oil, and other key raw materials would be a steady drain on Chinese wealth and capital. Chinese military strategists have been preoccupied with the threat of such political and economic warfare and have warned their country is at a significant disadvantage in a protracted struggle such as the U.S. successfully waged against the Soviets. Giving voice to this concern was a 2001 paper by Chinese military expert Yang Leming of China's National Defense University called Certain Issues on China Countering future economic sanctions. In summary, Yang wrote, warfare in the future is going to be fought mainly through economic means and he puts great strategic significance on countermeasures against economic sanctions to win the war. The primary way to curb inflation due to the high cost of imported energy and raw materials would be to let the value of the Chinese currency adjust upward to more realistic parity with the dollar. But that could risk choking off the flow of manufactured exports which have been the underpinning of China's growth miracle. Chinese policymakers are caught on the horns of a dilemma. Do they let their currency rise to make oil and other raw material imports more affordable or do they hold down the currency to encourage exports? Since the main goal is to create and sustain employment rather than to make a profit, the likely outcome is the PRC will fight tooth and nail to maintain the yuan at a significant undervaluation to the dollar. This means oil prices are likely to remain inflated for a protracted period. If it took a decade to cripple a weak Soviet Union, it might take twice that long for such policies to impact China. But oil may not be the only such commodity pressure point. Just about any basic commodity the PRC must import, from iron ore to soybeans, could be susceptible to similar price manipulation. What becomes apparent is that high oil prices might give the U.S. a cold, but China could get pneumonia, and the effect on reluctant U.S. allies, Saudi Arabia and Russia, would be nothing short of wonderful, not to mention the benefit to friends like Canada and Mexico, with whom the U.S. has been eyeing a possible North American version of the European Union. But the real issue is much bigger than money or politics, and all but unmentionable in public discourse. The U.S. and the Chinese view each other as strategic threats, and China's growth trajectory would put in an eventual position to force and win a showdown over who will dominate Asia and Taiwan. So the U.S., rather than accommodate the Chinese timetable for preparing for a U.S. confrontation and growing bigger, and increasing their naval strength, Pentagon planners may have decided to take control of that clock themselves, slowing or preempting China's buildup by raising the cost of economic growth and applying stress to what they view as China's rigid social and political system. Yes, the 2003 Iraq War was about oil, but not in the way most people suspect. Popular opinion holds that the U.S. moved in to both settle Bush family unfinished business with Saddam and to grab Iraq's vast oil reserves. That presumably would benefit U.S. oil companies or service giants like Halliburton, thus rewarding interests viewed as connected to the Bush administration. True, Halliburton's KBR unit became a major U.S. contractor in post-war Iraq, but since the war no major oil or oil field service companies from the U.S. or anywhere else have been allowed to take over operation, revitalization, or exploration of Iraqi oil assets. Post-war drilling activity using aging state-run rigs and lacking modern well technologies has been minimal and stunningly inefficient. 
Typical was a report in Platt's hologram describing the state of affairs more than two years after the war. It noted that during all of 2005 in northern Iraq, except for a small work area run by the U.S. contractor Parsons, essential field maintenance, reservoir management, well drilling, and workovers fall far short of required levels. So the point is, we're not there getting more oil out of the ground, putting in new technology to find the oil reserves. No, we were there for one reason and one reason only because the Chinese strategy in order to curb their dependency on foreign oil was to buy up all the oil reserves. What if war had not occurred and the Saddam Hussein regime had been freed of the UN sanctions as expected later that year in 2003? Iraq's oil ministry had confidently predicted in 1997 it would be producing 3 million barrels a day within one year of exiting the UN sanctions which have been in place since Iraq's 1990 invasion of Kuwait. Iraq had planned to boost its output to 6 million barrels a day in less than 10 years after sanctions and that was not an unreasonable goal given the fact that Iraq is second only to Saudi Arabia and found oil reserves with more than 100 billion barrels and likely to double that in probable reserves. Moreover, only about one-third of Iraq has been explored for oil. It is possible Iraq could hold more than Saudi Arabia's 250 billion barrels approved oil reserves. So Saddam was looking for investors such as his food for oil program. And the first and largest of these tentative Iraq PSA, PSA deals was signed in 1997 with the Chinese. State Major China National Petroleum Corp partnered with the PRC arms maker Norinco in a venture called Al Waha, which was given development rights to 50% of the huge Al Hadab field in eastern Iraq, covering some 250 square miles near the city of Al Kut. They were to invest $1.3 billion over 23 years and could expect to get 100,000 barrels a day from that $1.4 billion barrel proved oil reserve. By early 1998, even while beleaguered Bill Clinton was still president, the U.S. national security policy apparatus had shifted from a posture of Iraq containment to one of regime change. Saddam had crossed the line, and France, backed by Russia and China, formally proposed that the U.N. Security Council lift the Iraq oil embargo in place since 1990. That effort gained gradual momentum and by late 2002, after years of relentless pressure and revelations of scandalous mismanagement of its oil for food program, the UN appeared headed toward a lifting of Iraq sanctions. The oil embargo was expected to be over by the end of 2003. That would allow unrestricted development and sales of Iraq crude. It would also mean a surge of Chinese oil field workers who could effectively garrison Al Dab. Al Fayah and other key Iraq oil fields. Once the Chinese were there, as in the Sudan, they might never be removed without provoking direct military conflict between the U.S. and China. Washington was indeed facing a national security nightmare that would dwarf the problem created by armed Chinese presence in the Sudan. The erosion of international support for Iraq sanctions and the looming threat of Chinese boots on the ground there by late 2003 put the Bush administration under a severe time squeeze. To advert Chinese occupation of the Iraq fields, the U.S. would have little choice but to invade the country and occupy it, with or without allies or U.N. support. Moreover, that would have to happen before the summer of 2003 to avoid military operations during the desert summer. And the rest is history. After a brief and easy campaign, George Bush lands on the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln off the coast of San Diego, California. The Battle of Iraq is one victory in a war on terror that began on September the 11th, 2001. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended 
In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. Where freedom takes hold, hatred gives way to hope. When freedom takes hold, men and women turn to the peaceful pursuit of a better life. American values and American interests lead in the same direction. We stand for human liberty. So what am I saying here? We Americans are going to suffer high gas prices and high food commodities for a while because we are in an economic war with the Chinese and we are trying to cripple them with high food and gas prices. And above all, we will absolutely not let the Chinese control strategic proven oil reserves in the Middle East. So exactly where are we in our prophetic timeline today? I mean, people have thought the world was coming to an end many, many times, and I'm sure during World War II they thought so. We can enter World War III and people will think that's the end. You never know. So we have to look at what the Bible says about our prophetic timeline. There are certain things that must take place. And as of right now, it's starting to form. But we must keep looking for the labor pains that the Bible talks about. The times and the seasons, which we'll get into. But one thing we do know that happened is in Ezekiel chapter 37, the vision of the dry bones. The Lord brought Israel back to their land. We believe that has taken place. You wouldn't know that until it happened. But you got to be careful because starting like at verse 15, it goes into talking about the future Millennium Kingdom of Israel. But the vision of the dry bones has taken place. So we know we're past that. So I'll talk about pretty soon where I think we're starting in our prophetic timeline right now. What's the next prophecy we're looking for? But I'd like to go over America's role. Whether they'll have a role or not. One thing we do know for sure. That if America ceases to exist or declines in power, the world is going to be a very different place and it will shift sure, rapidly. What would happen if America was not here, the chaos the world would be put into. And I don't think that would have to happen because of the next prophecy that I'm going to talk about. The next prophecy that must appear is almost taking shape right now. So I don't believe the world can be thrown into a chaotic state. So let's see why America must remain. That you could have the United States withdrawing into isolation and nobody stepping into the breach, and then the whole world could end up being like the Balkans in the 1990s. The issue of humanitarian intervention is really a, a late 20th century phenomenon. It comes after the end of the Cold War. Uh, prior to the end of the Cold War, any sort of any United States action throughout the world would have risked a, a, a uh, an escalation into war or some sort of conflict with the Soviet Union. Once the Soviet Union goes away, in the United States is this unipolar military power. They have not only the ability to intervene militarily, and some people will say they have the responsibility to intervene. America i tekako treba da se umješa u tuđe poslove. Znači, ako je ova jači naoružan, treba ovoga što nema ubiti i ignaviti i terori i terorizam vršiti i terorizati taj narod koji nije naoružan. Americans always sort of give part of a possible solution of a problem to Europeans. But they are not quite able to get together. They cannot find a common statement, they cannot find a common policy, and that's why United States is sort of invited to come and to say, okay, I mean, we saw you cannot solve the problem. That's why we have to do it. 
We see when a country becomes threatening, totalitarian, brutal, that we've got to think about doing something about it. That our passiveness in the face of Pol Pot of Cambodia led to perhaps two million deaths out of eight million people. Our passiveness in Rwanda probably led to the death of 800,000 people. Had we intervened in some way, you might have reduced those numbers. We didn't. We didn't. The United States is the superpower of the world today because the United States cares. We're not only interested in our, in our own national concerns and in protecting our own national interests, we care ethically and morally. We, we care about democracy, we care about freedom. Well, promoting democracy might be true for Iraq. It meant a lot to me to see the Iraqi people voting for the first time in their history. The reason Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait was oil. If Kuwait was an agricultural country, he wouldn't come near us. To him, it was simple greed. And we thought as Kuwaitis that once Saddam did the invasion, that all the other countries will start to come to our rescue. And this was the sad awakening. They didn't. As a matter of fact, some of them took sides with Saddam. The alternative was to go to a superpower. United States was the alternative. While the Europeans believe that we are in the Middle East to get the oil, if you look at the distribution, you would find out that the U.S. is not the prime consumer of the Middle Eastern oil. Actually, most of the oil goes to China, Japan, and the European Union that has almost no production of their own. Take away the United States, and there's really no way of knowing what's going to happen. If there were no American commitment to the Middle East. Uh, if there had never been an American commitment to the Middle East, there would be no State of Israel. I think that's the first and most obvious point. It's very, very hard to imagine such a small state with so few assets surviving without American support. So you'd have to say goodbye to that. Sooner or later, Israel's enemies, including the current regime in Iran, would be able to wage a war against it that the Israelis would only be able to win at a colossally high price. So that's number one. Number two is what would the various states in that region do to one another absent the United States? We know that Saddam was capable of waging war against two of his neighbors uh, because he not only invaded Kuwait, but before that he went to war against Iran. We know that Lebanon was ripped apart by its neighbors and turned into a puppet state uh, by Syria. The list goes on and on. And if you take away the United States from this story, it seems to me you don't just have the destruction of Israel, but you then have the self-destruction uh, of the Arab world. It's a very, very volatile part of the world, and it seems to me that those who blame the problems of the Middle East on the United States or on the colonizers before the United States are completely missing the point. An interruption in Middle East oil production and flow uh, would have immediate severe economic dislocation throughout the world. Uh, economy in every level will be affected. Our allies in Europe would be the first to suffer, but certainly the Asians would suffer, particularly Japan right now, and the future China as well. And we don't understand that this is a globalized economy. So you can't sit there and say, oh, you guys have got problems. We can avoid it. We can't because oil is an international market. And it doesn't really matter where your oil is from, but if the biggest oil center isn't producing, everybody suffers. 
Right now, uh, the U.S. Army has about 21,000 soldiers in Korea. The purpose of the U.S. forces in this alliance is to deter North Korean aggression. And should that deterrence fail, then we're prepared to fight and win. North Korea is as big a threat as a madman with a nuclear bomb can ever be. That's to say, an almost unimaginably big threat. The regime in North Korea is the craziest in the world. It could wipe Seoul off the face of the earth tomorrow. In that sense, there's no bigger threat to global security than North Korea. They've made numerous incursions across the demilitarized zone. They've made attempts to assassinate and been successful in uh, killing many South Koreans at various locations around the world. He blew up half their cabinet in Rangoon in 1983. He sabotaged K-858 in 1987 with 115 South Koreans on it. He sent down assassination teams to take out the president. These are violent people. I understand that the North is still hostile, but if you look at South Korea, they're twice the size in terms of population, and their economy is about 20 times larger. More than that, they benefit of the latest U.S. weapons and training, and they don't seem eager to live under the regime of the dear leader. So why couldn't they defend themselves? で、軍で 국군의 절반이 게릴라 부대 북한의 특수 부대 이런 사람들 일시 공격을 하게 되면 한국이 아무리 막강한 군사력을 가지고 있다고 해도 그게 쉽지가 않겠죠. 그러니까 서울을 그냥 밀어버리는 거는 북한이 충분히 숨은 상이 있다고 생각하거든요. 그래서 지금 공격을 준비해서 훈련을 해서 독수 목적의 부대를 모두 를 호가 최소한 1일에 상대방의 반분 이상을 파괴하는 것이 가능하다고. 미국의 화력이 빠진 상태에서 쉽지가 않을 거예요. 그러니까 그 굉장히 위험하죠. 지금. The American presence is a deterrence to North Korean adventurist action. It's worked since 53, which is roughly 52 years, so I would say that's a test that it works. If the United States were to pull out from the Northeast arena and leave the region entirely in the hands of China, Japan, and, and Korea. I foresee a great chaos. So if we are in South Korea with all the weapons and technology, why have we left such a bad regime in power for so long? The United States has removed many regimes, and I can think of one that was worse than the North Korean one. But you see, Besides his nuclear weapons, Kim has another ace up his sleeve. A treaty of alliance with China. In North Korea, China has a wonderful bargaining counter. It's impossible for the United States to solve the problem of North Korea without China. It's been tried and it hasn't worked. You can't really keep the Chinese out of the equation because the Chinese keep that regime teetering on the brink of collapse, but not quite collapsing. And the Chinese are in payback mode. They profoundly feel that they were on the wrong end of the 20th century and they are going to be on the right end of the 21st century. I think their long-term objective is unquestionably hegemony in East Asia. And that must imply a subordination of Japan. It can't mean anything else. If the United States isn't there, Japan has to choose. Either it simply accepts subordination or it has to become a military equal. Uh, of China. So I do believe that the world stage is set. I don't believe there will be drastic changes as we head down the path toward Armageddon. I believe all the players are here and if every eye should see the return of Jesus Christ then I believe the whole world will be a part of it.
if you allow me to spend about 20 minutes here to go over some Bible truths that I think are essential for you to understand the prophecies of this book, uh, that's what I'll be doing. So without getting too preachy or theological, let me explain some Bible truths. My source will be the Judean Christian Bible. And what people would have you believe is that the writings in the Bible were all put together by councils uh, throughout the church age. And that simply is not true. When in fact, 7 to 15 of our New Testament books were in execution already by 100 AD. Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, wrote in his only surviving letter that he was using the four Gospels, the Book of Romans, and a couple other epistles of Paul. And that was around 100, 115 AD. Clement of Rome, in his letters, he used the four Gospels, the Book of Hebrews, Corinthians, Timothy, Titus, 1 Peter, Ephesians, and other epistles from Paul. And he extensively wrote about the deity and the Gospels of Jesus Christ. Ignitus of Antioch wrote letters to the church also discussing the Gospels that he used. So these pastors were using anywhere from 7 to 15 of the New Testament books that we have in our Bible today. And a lot of these church fathers all over Asia Minor had gotten together and decided that in order to be teaching the same truths in every church, they ought to be using the exact same writings. And they all agreed on by 188 D to use what they called the Mentorian Bible. And that Bible had 22 of the 27 books we have in our Bible today, they were using at 180 AD. That's about 130 years before the First Church Council of Nicaea. The only books in question were 3 John, James, 1st and 2nd Peter. Revelation was added later. So this even shows the discernment of our early church fathers to just not be willy-nilly and add any old books in. But they were careful in what books they considered to be inspired, what books the apostles considered to be inspired, and taught the deity of Jesus Christ. So when the Council of Nicaea rolled around in 325 AD, forced by the Emperor Constantine that all bishops come to this council and decide the matter of the Arianism sect versus the Christian sect, because he was trying to settle unrest in his empire. And that was one of the major issues among others. They didn't go there to decide what books were going to be in the Bible. They hardly had anything to do with it. All they added was those last four books we were talking about, First, Second, uh, Peter, and James. And that was it. It was confirmed by 108 of the 115 bishops that were there that Jesus Christ was God and he was holy and the books that they were using to teach the Christian world were, in fact, the inspired Word of God. That's what we have. And up until now, in all the archaeological discoveries, especially the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is so much evidence to authenticate that the books we have today are translated accurately back to the original manuscript. So when the basic question comes up, why all this spiritual stuff? Why are we just not born here, live, and die? The Bible answers questions to those humans that want to know, what are we doing here? And really it comes down to knowing God. And simply put, God created everything to declare his glory. He chose Israel to reveal himself to the world. Humans he created to relate to. And the Bible to communicate to us. That's the simplistic answer. What I'm going to cover right now 
this is part of the, I hope I don't get too preaching, is a more of a detailed answer of why God created this world. And remember, he had a grand design for his creation. He knew the world would fall into sin. He knew he would have to save a sinful, unlawful world and bring it back into holiness. That's the real trick. That's the glory of God. How do you take a sinful world, a sinful people, and still allow them their free choice, yet save them and make them holy once again? That's what I will try to show you here in a very short amount of time. The Bible is nothing but a history of rebellion. It's a constant account of rebellion. And rebellion is sin. The only way to wash sin away is the sacrificing and shedding of blood. This is all according to God's rules. In Hebrews 9, 11 through 14 and Hebrews 9 through 21 to 22, he tells us this. All early civilizations understood this. It was passed down to them. After the flood, they knew to sacrifice and the shedding of blood is what appeased the gods. God set the standards. He gave us the Ten Commandments to show us His righteousness and our unrighteousness. The ancient civilizations knew the only way to cleanse yourself of your unrighteousness was the sacrificing of blood. Most people have an idea of Jesus Christ the Savior is but they really have no idea what the Old Testament said about Jesus. The Old Testament, through Israel, is used as examples about Jesus Christ. Israel's in unbelief right now, and always will be until the Second Coming. The Old Testament is filled with references to Jesus Christ. But remember this, prophecy does not tell you the future. God could have easily done that. Instead, prophecy tells you what to look for in the future. Prophecy is a timeline, so that most events will not be unveiled until they happen, then you'll recognize them. That is why there are so many false prophecies, so many false warnings, false signals. That was Israel's problem, originally. Look at the prophets who prophesied to Israel. Remember, the prophets were prophesying about judgment, uh, Israel's destruction, their Messiah, the great kingdom in the millennium time of future days, end times, but you have to remember when the prophets wrote there were no chapters or verses. Prophets talked about different events in their writings and knew not what they wrote about. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1.10. It was not clear of who they were writing about. They had to search all the prophets writings, all the scriptures. Look at Daniel 8 and 9. The latter was actually written earlier than Daniel 8. Daniel 5 was written after Daniel 10 and so on. Look at Jeremiah 31, 33. They talk of destruction, captivity, then God will save them. In 33, it talks of the millennium kingdom. Jeremiah 23 talks of the Messiah. Look at Isaiah 53. It was written in past tense. Who would know who they were talking about until it happened? And then only if you studied the writings of the prophets. Jews were told all about Jesus Christ and his first coming. Some recognized it, most didn't. Now look in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. And Jesus said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The Jews are constantly being shown who Jesus Christ was. For example, in the Old Testament through Melchizedek, now there's an idea in Hebrews 7 where God explains to the Jews that Melchizedek was a righteous priest but not from the line of Levi which is all the Jewish priests come from. Aaron and his descendants are the priestly hereditary line under the law. Jesus is not of this line but he's the final priest everlasting which is the Melchizedek reference in Psalm 110.4. You have a priest without a hereditary line. But how can you have that? Because without a line, how do you become the high priest? Because it's Jesus' deity. The very question that comes into play, that Jesus could be the only high priest and welcomes all true believers to be associated priests with him. The law showed the Jew and us that we are sinners. It condemns us. God explained how Jesus Christ had to come down and 
once and for all saved the world. The Old Testament records how the Jews rejected God over and over and over it. All the prophets that God sent to the Jewish people. All the examples he gave them of Jesus Christ like so the Melchizedek, the slaughtering of the animals over and over and over. These were all examples that God was showing to the Jews that the animals and their blood was not really saving them from the sin. It was uh, a, for, a picture of what Jesus Christ, what God had to do. That would be the only true saving grace would be the shedding of his blood. And the Jews just missed the point. People today miss the point. So read Second Peter chapter 3 sometime, especially verse 8 and 9. He explains that God has not taken a long time for his second coming, but that he wishes none to perish. Let's not be so selfish. There's a lot of other people to be saved. Now to get back with the creation of why he did all this and why he had to design it this way, Let's look at the creation. Remember I said God created things for his glory. Well, look at Ephesians 3, 8. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfallible riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The heavenly places, rulers and authorities, that's the angels. He's making known to them his manifold wisdom. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose. That means this was the design from the beginning before he even created man. He carried out Christ Jesus our Lord. The purpose there. His design was there. So God creates the glory to show the angels his power and his wisdom. The angels were with God. They were spiritual like them. They knew who he was and what he can do. But as you know, there was a rebellion that took place. Not all angels thought that way. God had this plan to show them his power, might, and glory. So the question is, if God created the heavens and the earth according to Genesis 1-1, and it was good, what happened? Let me show you. Go to Matthew 13. It's a parable of the wheat and tares. I'm not going to read the whole thing. The parable is explained in verse 36. And it says, the one who sows the seed is the Son of Man. So Jesus Christ created the world, did the good in it. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the evil one. Who's the evil one? The enemy who sowed them is the devil. Devil brought in the evil ones. If you go back to verse 28 in that same parable, an enemy has done this, he says. An enemy done this. God created good. An enemy came in and created the tares. We know Satan was there. Genesis chapter 3, the Satan was in the garden, created the fall. So your next question is, well, why did God let that happen? Part of his grand design and to find true believers is all about love. The Bible teaches perfect love is giving. God doesn't demand it. He will not take it. You must give it. The angels had a choice and Lucifer rebelled. And Satan is living with his choice. God let him have his choice. And we will have our choice. Remember his design is to find true believers. If you go back to the parable of the wheat and the tares, the slave says, do you want me to go and gather up the tares? And God says, no. Because while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat. Allow both of them to grow together until the harvest. And in that time... I will say to the reapers, which are the angels, first gather up the tares and bind them in the bundles to burn them up. Because anybody who plants knows when things first start to grow, when you're young, you can't tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. That's the loving kindness of God. That's the love. He doesn't want any to perish. But as it grows and the fields get 
more mature or ready for harvest, you can tell the difference between the reapers, between, excuse me, between the uh, wheat and the tares. So he lets the world go and he's looking for the true believers and the ones that will truly follow God and obey him. Remember back in Ephesians 3, we we're talking about what is the manifold wisdom? This is what it is. If you go to Romans chapter 9, verse 23, it says, and 22, He let his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And if he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, also from the Gentiles. Who's the weaker vessels? We are. So when God creates the world, the heavens and the earth, and has his grand design for his glory, what is really his glory? His grace. That is the manifold wisdom. It's the grace that he gives to the weaker vessels that the angels are in awe about. Remember, they were there in the beginning. Lucifer was there. Read Ezekiel 28. But Lucifer rebelled. Lucifer was sent down to earth. The earth is his domain. God demonstrated to the angels that he was going to create this world. With Lucifer creating havoc and sin in it and he would still redeem the human population the weaker vessels to himself by killing himself on the cross the angels didn't know all the grand design God is showing them his glory which is his grace of how he was redeeming a sinful sinful unjust ungrateful world back to his holiness by sacrificing his blood. It was his rules and he made the ultimate sacrifice. That is what has the angels in awe. And so we all have the choice. Satan had his choice. He decided that he wanted to be God. He's going to live out his choice till the end. And so everybody says, why would he do this? The famous verse you all know, John 3.16, because he loved the world. That's the power of God. If you people don't understand the grace, that's what you need to learn about. And so every promise he made in the Bible, he has to fulfill. And that's why we are heading right into God's design to end of the world. Remember this, through the Old Testament, and because of Jesus Christ, people think their sins are overlooked or they don't matter. But one of God's characteristics or attributes is his righteousness. Everybody will answer for it. Everybody will be judged and be held accountable for their actions here on earth. That brings us to the end of the world. We have Satan to deal with. He rebelled against God. He started the first war. And as you've seen in the videos, there's been nothing but wars ever since. You can see in Luke 10, 18, how Satan fell from the sky like lightning. God knew he would cause the fall of mankind. And God demonstrated his grace. We already explained all that. While Satan was on earth and his opponent. So he will deal with Satan. You go to Isaiah 14, and that is what Satan is all about. He wants to be like God, and he wants to be worshipped like God. Satan believes he can win. He thought he can win in heaven. He thought he can do a better job than God. He thought he can be like God, and he still does. And so we began our war series with the fall of creation, with Satan in the beginning, and we're going to end it in the book of Revelation chapter 22 with the destruction of Satan as we continue our look in prophecy as we march toward Armageddon